What do you get when you take something that's already great and improve it? Because that's exactly the situation we find ourselves in with the Ryzen 2000 series of processors and the B450 motherboards. Last April, AMD shocked the tech world by releasing Ryzen. It silenced any doubts that the company would be able to compete with Intel once again in the CPU arena. But over a year later, of course, the company have released Zen Plus, which features an updated architecture, subtly improving and tweaking the flaws of the original processors and addressing some of the problems. And the company have also released the 400 series motherboards, which do pretty much the same thing, making subtle improvements to what was already great. We see an overall better VRM design, better overclocking, memory support, and other tweaks which just improve the entire products. My name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Theatre Com video, we're going to be reviewing the AMD Ryzen 5 2600X and the MSI B450 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard. Do know that we will send both samples by MSI for the purposes of review, however, both have since gone back to the company. This is not a sponsored video, and all opinions are, of course, our own. In my humble opinion, while you can certainly debate the performance advantage Intel has over AMD in terms of minimum frame rates, it's very hard to argue the sheer value that the B450 and the Ryzen 5 series of CPUs brings to the table. At a glance, the B450 chipset is very similar to that of the X470. There are concessions to be made, sure, the number of USB ports is snipped and IO is diminished compared to that of its more expensive brother, but the most important aspects of the chipset remain intact. AMD have made incredibly wise decision to leave overclocking features of the board as is, and we'll discuss manual overclocking soon enough. Precision Boost Overdrive, XRF2, all of these features remain consistent from X470 down to the B450. If you are in the market for a gaming focused build and are aiming to have just a single GPU, a modest number of drives and so on, you could do much worse than saving your pennies and grabbing a B450 over an X470 board. Okay, so how does the B450 distinguish itself from its predecessor, the B350, and if you have a B350 board, should you jump and make that upgrade? Well, for a start, B450, much like X470, is much kinder to different memory configurations and tends to just be more compatible. You'll also notice slight tweaks to the VRM and power distributions of the board, but these are minor tweaks in general. Other major improvements include precision boost to overdrive and store MI. Store MI is particularly interesting, allowing you to combine multiple drives together in a single volume. So, for example, you could combine an SSD and the standard mechanical drive, and you get fast access times and transfer times as the system figures out which files you use more consistently. It's a brilliant system, but it is not officially supported by the B350 or X370 chipset. There's also Precision Boost Overdrive, allowing the motherboard to easily can be configured within the BIOS, although this feature is currently being worked on further, and pretty much offers you greater multi-threading performance and single-core performance by adjusting frequencies and other settings automatically. The fact of the matter is that AMD hit Intel in the same way they have for both the data centers and the CPU for the desktops themselves. Value for money. Sure, you'll get less of overclocking a Ryzen 2000 series than, let's say, a Coffee Lake process, but that is not the point. It's giving users a product in the mid-range desktop, which the B450 firmly caters to, and it does not feel hamstrung. MSI continues its tradition of color scheme with the Gaming Pro Carbon lineup, and we have the usual blacks, dark greys with the on-bit of silver, white and red thrown in to break up the overall design. Starting out with the board's rear, and you get the PS2 combination port, LAN, speaker and audio connectors for 7.1 audio, including the obligatory optical S. PDIFL, DisplayPort, HDMI, couple of USB 2 connectors, USB 3.1 Gen 1 and Gen 2, both Type A and C, and connectors where you can attach the aerials for both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. Oh, and the BIOS Flashback Plus button. The board has a PCIe 3.0 times 16 slot, which is outfitted by MSI's Steel Armor technology, a PCIe 2.0 16 slot, and three PCIe times one slot. So this motherboard does support dual graphics solutions, but only Crossfire, so AMD's own GPUs. And this is with the knowledge that one of the cards will be running in a PCIe 2.0 slot. 
A small note, MSI also state that they support RAM officially up to 2667 MHz, which is JDEC endorsed, but support can be achieved for RAM way over 3466 MHz with AXMP. We actually used this board for an upcoming ADATA memory kit review, and it operates at a default of 2667 MHz for that specific kit. Using this board, we overclocked the RAM way into the stratosphere with no problems. Obviously a great positive for the memory, but it also shows that MSI's kit is more than up to the task. The motherboard other than that is pretty much what you'd expect. Four RAM slots supporting up to 64GB of RAM, six SATA 3.0 ports, two M2 ports, with a heat spreader on the first slot, it did knock down the temps of our Crucial MX500 uh, drive a few degrees. We'll place a link to the MX500 review in the video description. There's also ports for the front audio, 4 times 4 pin uh, fan connectors, a CPU fan and a pump fan as well, a single 2 pin LED power connector, 2 5050 RGB LED strip connectors, one WS2812B connector, a TPM connector, and support for an additional set of USB ports. Oh, and that flashback plus button I mentioned earlier, no. Unfortunately, pressing the button doesn't boot up the remastered version of the 16-bit classic. Instead, it gives you the next best thing. By popping in a USB key, you can flash the latest BIOS, and not need to install a CPU, RAM, or even a GPU. This feature is helpful for lazy system builders, but if you buy this board in three months and happen to have an older BIOS revision and AMD have released an unrecognized CPU or new RAM is released and this board doesn't recognize that, but the BIOS fixes it, or even if next year AMD releases the Ryzen 3007 NM CPUs and you forget to BIOS flash first, this feature is going to be the bestest friend in the whole wide world that you've ever had. The board uses a Ridgetech RT8894 PWM controller, and given the face design, we're likely looking at a 4 plus 2 layout for this board. For those worried about this, don't worry, it's more than sufficient for a Ryzen processor, and is certainly ample for a B450 board. Even during overclocking and putting over 1.4 volts through the CPU and pushing lots of multi-threading work, the VRMs remain cool and the board totally stable. As for what's in the box, the manual and support frisbee, the rear I.O. cover, hands up who has installed a motherboard before and totally forgot the I.O. cover, I certainly haven't done that when I was a newbie, <clears throat> a couple of SATA cables, the Wi-Fi antenna, Mystic Lite cable, the manuals, registration card, cable, cable labels, and finally, the MSI case badge logo. The motherboard is designed well enough, generally there's no obvious areas who wish the components had been moved up say half an inch from one another. A small gripe I could place would be the board on the upper left, where the power connectors are located. There's a dual 8 and 4 pin connector, and that space is a little cramped, particularly when you've got the heat sinks there as well. I imagine a smaller case could have a problem plugging the cables or unplugging if the board is in place. The 4 pin is not required, and honestly it's more marketing generally speaking. There's no way that a single Ryzen 7 2700X could draw enough power to hit the limits of the 8 pin, unless you're putting it in insane voltage and cooling it with enough liquid nitrogen to freeze the core of the sun. Speaking of cooling, we didn't have any issues plonking in the Corsair AIO we had on hand, but if you're using a really big air cooler, it's possible you might have clearance issues, so do double check the size of your cooler first for clearance. MSI's Click BIOS is easy enough to use and feature packed, providing access to all of the relevant board settings. There are two different modes, the first of which is EZ mode, which is the default when you very first boot into the BIOS. It's simple enough, the main window is an overview of the system specs with the BIOS revision, installed RAM, CPU and so on, plus features and clock of the CPU. There's also the usual options for configuring and tweaking storage, AXMP to automatically set RAM clocks and timings, a game boost button, which is a one-click overclock for your processor, the amount depending on the CPU which is installed in your particular machine. Beyond that, there's also the advanced menu, and this is catering for power users. This is where you'll find overclocking options, use of configurable timings for RAM, adjust CPU features such as disabling SMT or processor cores. Say if you want to disable the built-in Wi-Fi if you're not going to use it because you're using Ethernet, and much more. 
Its feature plankton should cater to power users rather nicely, although MSI and AMD provide various tweaking and overclocking software such as Ryzen Master. You can quite happily handle all the things in the BIOS, including fan curves and for users who like minimal startup and a clean and simple OS install, or if you're booting between several OSs and therefore just want to not keep adjusting settings. Doing all of this in the BIOS is intuitive and simple enough. Audio quality. Fortunately, the motherboards sport really great audio. As you can see on screen, the overall rating here was excellent for right mark audio analyzer. This is a premium B450 board, and the extra cache is going on things such as better camps and components to improve the quality of audio, and it's really evident. As for Nehemic, we've already covered Nehemic rather extensively in our recent B360 motherboard test. The functionality is pretty much the same here, so we'll just add that testing to the end of this video, or you can check out the B360 review, which is linked, of course, in the video description. Overclocking. We were using the MSI B450 Gaming Pro Carbon motherboard with an unopened retail sample Ryzen 5 2600X, although it was provided by MSI. We weren't using any fancy water loops, just a Corset AIO, and that was about the lot. Even so, as you can see from our overclocking results, we did pretty well. Hitting over 4.3 GHz was pretty simple. 4.4 wasn't doable though, at least stable. The board would boot and sometimes crawl into windows, and if we pumped about 1.4 volts through, it would about limp through single thread tests such as Cinebench, but it would quickly lock up on multi-threading. And games, well, huh, games are about as stable as a unicycle in a hurricane. But with that said, it's still fairly impressive the CPU got into Windows at that speed and does demonstrate the VRM and the board itself aren't going to be an issue with overclocking. We also hit 3466 MHz with a data memory we were testing, albeit with looser timings than what would be ideal, but this is to do with the RAM and not the motherboard, and once again we'll be reviewing this RAM soon, so hold on tight. MSI have a pretty large list of software that's available for this board. That is, in addition to the various drivers, of course, you can find. Starting things out with Mystic Light 3, allowing you to configure onboard LEDs of the motherboard, along with lighting for your components too. So, for example, case LEDs, GPU lighting, and even RAM, such as with the Adata RAM we're using here. It can also be configured for various templates. You can configure your own or just turn off the lights altogether. If it's not your thing, or if it's nighttime, you want to leave your rig to, say, download a game from Steam. Applications like Command Center provide similar functionality to AMD's own Ryzen Master, offering you the ability to tweak clock speeds and voltages, and with Command Center also change fan profiles and much more. It's easy and intuitive, but Ryzen Master is a little nicer for power users because you can do things like disable SMT and so on. Yeah. There's also the usual suspects, such as Live Update, which updates all of the motherboard drives and software with a few clicks and also MSI's gaming app. This provides control for lighting and so on, but also allows you to configure various shortcuts for MSI hardware, such as mouse and keyboard shortcuts, use drag and eye to watch YouTube or stream videos while you're uh, gaming, and much more. The Ryzen 5 2600X is probably about the best CPU for gamers in AMD's current CPU lineup, with the CPU retailing about £100 cheaper than the 2700X. A quick overview of the specs then, 6 cores, 12 threads, 16MB of level 3 cache, 256KB of level 2 cache per core, base clock of 3.6GHz and a max boost of 4.2, although this is overclockable with XFR and Precision Boost Overdrive. And of course, users can adjust clocks and voltages too, thanks to it being an X chip. As with the 400 series boards, AMD took what they had with Zen and improved it with Zen Plus architecture. One of the key ways they've done this is by moving to the 12 nm process and tweaking clocks. They can't compete with Intel quite yet, but it is enough to provide a little extra grunt to things. AMD also reworked the memory controller for Zen Plus, allowing it to handle faster RAM speeds without as much encouragement and grumbling, and also tweaked the cache for fast access times and lower latencies. We did actually extensive testing in a previous video comparing a 2700X against the 1700X to check out IPC performance, so if you want to go ahead and check that out, you can find it linked in the video description. There is also other stuff we've discussed, such as XFR2. To put it simply, a Ryzen 5 2600X is not going to convince a 1600X user to upgrade, but it is a refresh of an existing architecture, allowing AMD to squeeze a bit more life out of Zen before next year's Zen 2, which would be based on 7nm and offer a broad list of changes and improvements.
The Ryzen 5 2600X is a beastly chip. We pit it against the Ryzen 7 2700X, albeit on an X470 motherboard. You can find more details of that linked in the video description. And an i7 8700. You can also find more details of that in the video description. And we also overclock the Ryzen 5 2600X to boot. In our comparison, we pit it up against the Ryzen 7 2700X and an Intel i7 8700 processor and throw in some overclocked Ryzen 5 2600X results too. Starting out, as always, is Ryzen of the Tomb Raider, which we suspect will either be replaced outright or at least added to by Shadow of the Tomb Raider when it's released in a few weeks. We're using DirectX 12 mode here on high settings and between the two Ryzen models there's not much difference at all in frame rate. In fact, it just falls into margin of error territory. Ryzen of the Tomb Raider does scale rather well with CPU cores, particularly in a few areas such as Geothermal Valley, but as our CPU core count scaling tests, but as our CPU core count scaling tests demonstrated, you can check them out in the video description. A dozen threads or more is more than sufficient to power this game. Intel's i7-8700 does win here. The high clock frequency is simply scoring the win, but then it is a considerably more expensive chip to boot. Batman Arkham Knight is up next on the podium, and it's a DX11 game with a lot of open world environments. Again, Intel take the lead, but truthfully, being only 11 FPS faster, 140 to 151, is only going to affect those with very high refresh rate screens, and once again, it shows the sheer value here of the 2600X. Deus X and again, the 2600X and 2700X are neck and neck. And the same is also true for Hitman in DX12 mode. Again, Intel take the lead, but the difference will be only noticeable in CPU bound scenarios and if you're just not pushing the GPU. And finally, for games, we have Tomb Raider 2013 and Ashes of the Singularity. 2013 is within the margin of error, once again, and as for Ashes of the Singularity, the results speak for themselves. The 8700 is beating the 2700X purely because of clock speed, and the 2600X is bringing up the rear with the GPU tests. While the CPU test is clearly a bigger difference, but actually the singularity is considerably more extreme than most cases. And then onto synthetics, the single core score here remains as you would expect. Intel clearly have the advantage with the 2700X trouncing it in multi-threading. The CPU Z story is similar enough with clock speed victory of the 8700 pipping the 2600X to the post and the 2700X and its eight cores running off with victory. Corona 1.3, and here we go. 20 seconds 8700 has over the 2600X being the familiar clock speed story again, and the 2700X again holding victory simply by throwing threads at the problem until that problem is calculated away. It's always hard to predict what tech of the future is going to look like, and of course the same could be said for gaming. But, for the here and now at least, if gaming is your primary concern, then there's little difference between the Ryzen 5 2600X and the Ryzen 7 2700X. The frame rates are pretty much identical. If you are wanting to build a system load for other usage, other than games, for example you want to do Photoshop work, or audio editing, or video editing, or possibly streaming, and you have the budget, but you don't quite need the ridiculous performance, or you can't afford a Threadripper 2 series CPU, then perhaps you would be better served with the Ryzen 7 2700X. But for pure gaming, 6 cores, 12 threads is more than ample enough for now. Even we suspect with a high-end graphics cards like the upcoming RTX 20 series. Well, of course, we'll be doing in-depth testing with this, so do feel free to check back with us at Red Gaming Tech, and well, you can see those results for yourself. Bringing this review to a close then, this motherboard did not give us an ounce of trouble. VRMs were cool when overclocking. The audio quality was absolutely fantastic. Memory compatibility was awesome. As I said, we've tied four different sets of memory kits and none of them provided any issues at all. And not only that, but they all hit their maximum overclocking potential. Combine those with premium quality features such as built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and premium quality capacitors as well, which is definitely noticeable on things such as the audio. And yes, this board is certainly worth the extra cash.
If you are in the market for a premium B450 motherboard, then we would advise you to check this motherboard out and give it serious consideration. If, however, this is a little more expensive than what you are perhaps willing to pay for a B450 motherboard, then by all means check back with us because we'll have considerably more B450 reviews coming up on the channel over the next couple of weeks and months. But with all of that said, hopefully you have found this review informative and helpful. If you have the normal stuff, please feel free to like, share, comment, and subscribe because that helps us out an awful lot. We are also on Patreon. That's not to say that you have to pledge or anything like that, but if you do choose to give just a single dollar a month, it does help us significantly by helping us buy new equipment, keeping cameras updated, and so on and so on. But if you can't afford to do that or just simply don't want to, then do know that just viewing our content and just, you know, being there for us does help us a significant amount. You can also find affiliate links to these products in the video description. So if you are considering buying them, do feel free to check them out via the affiliate links. We do, of course, get a few pennies from that. And once again, it's another way to help us out if you so desire. But with all of that said, hopefully you have a great day or evening and take care of yourselves. Bye for now.